is the JAMA paper from March 2011. And the research question that this paper asks is, does lowering the threshold for detection of plasma troponin improve clinical outcomes in patients with suspected ACS? Did anyone find this paper kind of confusing? I, I did. So I'll just put that out there. Uh, I found this paper kind of confusing. And, and the reason is that it takes a different approach to answering the question than the previous paper did. So the study design in this paper is actually a before and after study design. So what happened at this particular institution where they did the study is that they had a validation phase and an implementation phase. And they decided to take advantage of what was essentially a natural experiment occurring in their institution and compare patient outcomes in their group uh, from the validation phase and the implementation phase to each other. So you actually have two groups of patients whose outcomes are being compared and they're receiving different interventions. So this is a little bit more conceptually like a therapy trial than like a trial of a diagnostic test. So if you think about it that way, what's happening in this paper becomes a little bit more clear, I think. So rather than comparing the diagnostic test to a gold standard of diagnosis, the test threshold, so whether they used um, 0.2 nanograms per mil or 0.05 nanograms per mil as their threshold for the test is the intervention that's being looked at. The population that they're looking at is a population of uh, two, two co cohorts, essentially, of, of consecutive patients who presented to this hospital in Edinburgh um, between February and July in 2008 and February and July in 2009. So two consecutive years, same period of time, same seasonality in both years. The patient information and clinical outcomes were obtained from an electronic patient information system. So essentially, a lot of the information that's presented in this paper comes from a database. It's not collected prospectively with the patients, but it comes from looking retrospectively through a database of patients who were within the catchment area of this hospital. Uh, the inclusion criteria, so fairly straightforward. The patients to get into the study had to have symptoms of chest pain of suspected cardiac origin. They had to have measurements of plasma troponin I concentration, and those measurements had to be either at admission at 12 hours after symptom onset or both. They were excluded if they had a non-cardiac diagnosis. Uh, also, if they had tachyarrhythmia, anemia, valvular heart disease, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, pericarditis, cocaine use, or if the patients resided outside of the region. Uh, and, and essentially, that's to make the follow-up more convenient for the researchers to obtain. We'll talk a little bit more about that particular point later on in the discussion. So they had a lot of patients in this study. They had 3,434 patients who met the inclusion criteria. They excluded 1,342 patients based on their exclusion criteria that they set out a priori. And they ended up with 2,092 patients in the study. And uh, in the first group, there were 1,038 patients. And in the second group, there were 1,054 patients. They were looking at a high sensitivity plasma troponin I assay. So this is different than the assay that we used here. This is troponin I versus troponin T. And this one that they studied is made by Abbott Architect Assays in Abbott, uh, Abbott Park, Illinois. Uh, they used, just to be clear, they used the exact same assay in both phases. They didn't switch assays between the phases of this study. What they switched was what information they provided to the clinician. So same assay in both phases. In the first phase of the study, they just told the clinician if the result was above the previous threshold of 0.2 nanograms per mil, okay? And in the second phase, they told the clinician if the assay result was above the new high sensitivity threshold of 0.05 nanograms per mil. Is that clear? Does anyone have questions so far about what's going on here? Okay. So just to be clear, the intervention that's evaluated isn't the new assay itself. The new assay is used in both phases. The new reporting threshold is being evaluated here. That's the difference between these two phases of the study. There's a little assumption that's made here, which is probably an okay assumption, but it is an assumption that they don't give you any further information on. They essentially assume that with their new assay, the result of 0.20 uh, nanograms per mil with the high sensitivity assay is the same as the result that they would have obtained uh, if they were getting a result of 0.2 nanograms per mil with a standard troponin I assay. It's probably a safe assumption to make, but they don't really discuss that point. Uh, and there may have been a little bit of difference between these two assays, even though they came from the same laboratory. So what they did was they stratified their patients into three groups based on the peak plasma troponin I concentration. So even though the clinicians didn't know, 
uh, in the first group, the researchers did know whether the patients were stratified below 0 0.05, in between 0 0.05 and 0.19, or greater than or equal to 0.2. So they took both the, the first phase and the second phase, they stratified them all into the three groups. The primary outcome that they were looking for is a clinical outcome. They were looking for the rate of subsequent readmission of MI, with MI, sorry. The, and the way that they defined that was that they said a subsequent MI was an admission with either chest pain or ST segment deviation and evidence of myocardial necrosis uh, using a plasma troponin of a concentration of at least 0 0.05. Then they also looked at as a primary outcome death from any cause and they created a composite endpoint that was both of those things. Their secondary outcomes, just for the patients in that mid-range troponin group, they looked at all hospitalizations, excluding the admissions with MI, so all the other hospitalizations people in those groups, in that, those two groups had, and hospitalizations due to bleeding specifically. Table three in your paper, if you have it, you can take a look. I've extracted some data from the table just to make it a little bit more clear what's going on with the results, because it's a very busy table. There's a lot of numbers that are reported, but these are the things that come out in their reporting of the results and the discussion that follows. So three main things that they said were their results. So first of all, they said, and this is the uh, green highlight on the screen, they said in the control group, which they're calling the validation phase, but in the control group for this study, the patients with troponin assay concentrations between 0 0.05 and 0.19 were more likely to have died or been readmitted with an MI compared with those with troponin assay concentrations that were either above or below that. So they said this mid-range group did worse in the control phase. They also said, okay, well, the proportion of patients with death or MI at 12 months was unchanged for patients with troponin concentrations that were less than 0 0.05 or greater than 0 0.2. So that's the blue. So between the befores and the afters, with the, and that's the blue highlighting, they said there wasn't any change for those two groups at the extreme. So the people who were definitely negative both times and the people who were definitely positive both times, their outcomes didn't change. And then the third thing that they said, and this is highlighted uh, in the yellow, uh, they said reducing the diagnostic threshold to 0 0.05 nanograms per mil improved clinical outcomes in patients with troponin concentrations in the mid-range. And this is the main sort of outcome of their paper and what they present in their abstract is their outcome. Now, it's worth noting that in the text of the paper, they present slightly different numbers here. And I don't know if somebody made a typo and they just didn't catch it before it went to publication. I've gone with the numbers that are in the table because these numbers do add up with who they say was in their, in their study. But if you actually read the paragraph in the text, the numbers are off just a little bit and I don't know why that happened. So they talk about uh, in, the, in the implementation phase or in the, uh, uh, the, the phase when the, the new threshold was reported, they have a 21% rate of the composite endpoint of death or MI, and before in the control group they had a 39%. So they're, they're talking, of, they, they calculate an odds ratio around that, which they calculate at 0.42, with a confidence interval of 0.24 to 0.84, and we'll talk about that in a minute as well. In terms of their secondary outcomes, they reported that they didn't find any difference in other hospitalizations between uh, the groups. They didn't find any differences in hospitalization due to bleeding between the groups. So let's look at some critical appraisal questions. I'm using different questions than Morgan did because this is a different way of approaching the question of the diagnostic test, right? So this one is looking at the test as an intervention. So we're gonna use the questions that we would use to look at a paper that's about an intervention. So did the intervention and control groups start with the same prognosis? Well, I don't know for sure. And the reason, there's a few reasons that I don't know for sure about that. Part of this is one of the inherent limitations of a before and after design. So we're always concerned about whether sources of bias can creep into a study that we're looking at. And when you have a before and after design, you can be pretty sure that there are going to be some sources of bias that are going to creep in. Even if the patients are essentially the same at both points in time when you collect your cohorts for your study, the circumstances of your healthcare system probably change over time. And unfortunately, the authors don't give us any information about whether at their institution, the management of their cardiac patients changed in that intervening year. So we're assuming when we look at the results of the study that any changes in outcome are due to the new test. But we don't know that for sure. Maybe they got a new cardiologist. Maybe they got a second cath lab. 
Maybe something else happened in their institution that affected the outcome of their patients, and we just don't know. They don't make it clear to us whether there were any other changes or not. Having said that, it's not unreasonable to use this design. I can't even comprehend the complexity of trying to do a randomized control trial on this topic. It would be expensive and extremely difficult to do. So they've taken advantage of a situation that's naturally occurring in their setting to do a study. And, and I can't really fault them for that. I just need to say there's limitations to this design that we have to understand when we interpret the data. The pro another problem that does come up, though, that I think could have probably been looked at uh, you know, in the way that they conducted their research was the retrospective data collection. Some of this data, at least, came from databases and was, was uh, inputted retrospectively. And we know that when that happens, there's just less accuracy to the data than if it's collected prospectively. So that is something that wasn't really addressed in their discussion very well. And it causes us to ask questions, you know, is the information that they provide in tables one and two entirely accurate if it all came from databases? And they're not clear what parts of those tables came from databases and what might have been collected prospectively. So it raises a few questions, uh, and I wish that they provided a little bit more information about their methods there that could have maybe made us feel more reassured. So in terms of blinding in this study, we're not really sure about the blinding. And again, more information would have helped us. The patients probably were unaware. Not necessarily, but probably. The clinicians knew which test the patient had because they knew whether it was one year or the other year and what their laboratory was giving them. We don't actually know if the data collectors, <laughs> adjudicators, and analysts knew. And those people could have been blinded, and blinding those people would have been helpful, particularly the adjudicators of outcome who went back and looked at the outcomes of the patients. We would really like to know that they didn't know uh, which tests the patients had. Was the follow-up complete? Again, we can't be sure. At first read, it really looks like the follow-up was entirely complete because they don't talk about anybody in either group being lost to follow-up. But it's hard to believe that you could have 2,000 patients in a study and not lose even one of them. And so I, I feel concerned about this point. And, and again, it, it's a question that I would like to know the answer to. So if they went back um, 450 days after the patient's initial presentation to hospital, and they looked in their database and said, well, you know, this person isn't dead and this person hasn't come back, that's probably not enough to assure me that that person is alive and well. So I don't, I don't have any, you know, way of being sure that some of these people, people didn't move out of the area and then have an MI and die, for instance. So there's, there's some question there about how complete the follow-up was. It appears in the paper to be very, very complete, but so complete that it makes me suspicious that there might have been uh, room for more description of how the follow-up was accomplished. Um, so getting to this point in the critical appraisal, I've said unsure enough times that we're probably pretty clear that we're unsure about how this paper is going to help us in our clinical practice. There's already enough going on here methodologically and enough questions that I have to make me feel unsure that the conclusions of this study will really be helpful to me. But having said that, let's go on and just look at the, the treatment effect and the size of that and pre precision around that effect and just see what we think about it. So how large was the treatment effect? Well, if you look at this mid-range group and you say, well, with the, with the old threshold, they had an event rate, a composite endpoint event rate of 39%. And in the new, um, and with the new threshold, they only had an event rate of 21%. That's a difference of 18%. It's clinically significant to me. I would like to know about that if that's really what's going on. That's something that affects a lot of patients and something that is a big enough effect to be of interest to me personally as a clinician. The confidence interval is wide. Uh, it's, it's quite wide, 0.24 to 0.84. And I just want to make a point about why it's so wide. So the width of your confidence interval doesn't really get narrower with the number of people in your study, because there's a lot of people in this study. They've got a lot of cases in this study. But what they don't have is a ton of events in the study. And this is pretty common in, uh, in the field of cardiology, because events are rare. So if you look at this, you know, you've got your 2,000 people there. There's not that many people that had that died. There's not that many people that had MIs. And even when you look at the composite endpoints, there's not that many people in your study that had the events of interest. So it's the number of events in your study that really help that confidence interval to narrow itself down. And, and so this is not something that's unique to this paper, but within this field of research, sometimes you get these wider confidence intervals because the events that we're looking for are just less common um, than in some other fields. <coughs> 
Um, what else? Oh, I did want to make a point that the multiple comparisons in this paper aren't properly accounted for. So they didn't do the proper statistical things that you should do when you're going to make a lot of comparisons among groups. So that is a, a weakness of the paper. Um, in regards to the composite endpoints, so um, <coughs> In order to try to narrow that confidence interval down, it's not uncommon to see um, composite endpoints used in papers like this. So, uh, you know, instead of just looking at MI as your endpoint, you look at MI plus death together because you want to get more events so that perhaps your confidence interval can be narrower. Um, so, are the component endpoints of similar importance to patients? It's not, I'm not really sure if, if you know, if you asked a patient and said, is it as important to you to know if you're going to have a recurrent MI or to know if you're going to die? That might not be the same thing to patients, and we do lump them together, but it, it might not have the same value to patients. Patients might say, well, you know, if I have another little teeny tiny heart attack, I'm not as worried about that as if I end up dead within the next year. It might not, you know, it, it might not be the same value to patients. Um, and then did the component endpoints occur with similar frequency? Well, in this case, they actually did occur with fairly similar frequency, so that's all right. Are the patients similar to my patients? Again, not enough information for me to know. Um, presumably, at least some of these patients presented to this hospital through their emergency department, but we don't know if there were also other tracks through which they presented. So were some referred in from their primary care providers and included in this study? were some admitted to internists and included in this study. There's not enough information for me to actually know in my clinical practice if the patients in this paper reflect what I see in my practice. Did they consider all the patient important outcomes? I'm not sure that they did. I mean, death and recurrent MI are certainly important. There's no doubt about that. Um, but patients might have other perspectives on this. They might say, well, you know, it's important to me how well I function. You know, if I've had an MI and it's being missed and now I develop CHF and I can't do my daily activities, that's probably a, a patient important outcome, uh, at least to, to some patients that, that would have or could have been considered possibly. Uh, and then are the likely treatment benefits worth the potential harm and cost? We just, we don't know. And, and I think that this comes back to the discussion that we've long had around here over the past months or year as we've transitioned to a high troponin assay here as well, is you know, you're gonna pick up a lot more people who don't truly have the disease. The sensitivity of your test may go down. Uh, and, and you're going to now start to investigate a lot more people. You may start to treat a lot more people. And not everyone who you're going to start investigating and treating has the disease, but they will be exposed to the risks of those investigations and treatments. And so I have to say that I'm unsure, based on the results of this paper, whether, um, whether we should switch our thresholds, whether we should start looking at this mid-range group as, as having had a cardiac event and start treating them like that or not. So I have to say, and, and I, I think this paper is a good one to bring up for us because it has been used to support the idea that these high sensitivity troponins improve clinical outcomes. I think, uh, hopefully I, I've convinced you here today that there's enough, there are enough things going on in this paper that we can't use this paper to support this notion at this point in time. The, the data isn't here and it isn't rigorous enough, I think, for us to make this conclusion that, that some people have made. Um, and I think also we have to be honest and say that definitively answering the study question is going to be very difficult. Um, you, you know, to, as I said before, to conduct a randomized controlled trial to answer this question is going to be awfully difficult. And even if you did something like, um, you know, some sort of quasi-randomization or some sort of stratified or cluster-randomized trial, uh, it would be logistically difficult and very expensive to do. So uh, it's a question that we may not get a satisfactory answer to.